If you have your Bible, please open them to Galatians chapter 4, where we look at this idea of slavery into sonship. And I asked Ava if she would read the last two verses of chapter 3 to help set up the context for these first seven verses of chapter 4. And I want to kind of walk us together through this idea to, uh, to better understand what it is that God is doing here, what Paul, the apostle who's writing this letter, wants the churches of Galatia to understand about their role, about their position, about who they are as followers of Jesus and about what is required of them and what's not required of them. That's really what a lot of the Galatians is about. It's about what is required and what's not required. And what's required, just to summarize where we've been the last couple of weeks, what required is faith in Jesus. And what's not required is obedience to the law. In fact, we, a couple weeks ago, put up some gospel math for you. It said this, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Uh, that's a good thing to hold on to. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. If you want to get eternal life, you want to get everything, then what you need is Jesus. And all the other things that the world offers actually don't hold uh, much, uh, much strength uh, at the end of the day. And so as we look at this passage today, I think there's kind of two big questions that I want to hopefully answer by the end of the time. I put them uh, up here on the screen for you. The first is, do I think of God as my father? Do I think of God as my father? Do you think of God as your father? When you think about God, what is the way in which you think about him? Do you think about him as your father? J.I. Packer in his famous book, Knowing God, said one of the uh, most foundational things that could be said about a Christian is that they have a view of God as father. That they understand their relationship to God is that he is father and that we are his children. So, do I think of God as my father? I want to talk about that as we go. Number two, do I feel or do I experience God as my father? Do I, when I go through my day, when I experience life, do I interact with him as though he is indeed my father? And so that's where I, I hope to take us as we go uh, today and uh, to try to help us see how all of these verses really lead up to kind of the main point that's found in verse 7. And I don't, you don't need to go back there, we'll go there in a second, but the, the verse 7 of chapter 4 says, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Uh, and so how does this relationship to us as God help us understand, or excuse me, to God uh, over us, how does it help us to understand this main point of the sermon? And that is if you have come to faith in Christ, you are an heir of God and a recipient of his eternal inheritance. This is what Paul wanted the Galatian churches to understand, to see themselves as full-blown heirs of the promise, whether they were Jewish or not, whether they obeyed the law or not, it wasn't about the law. What he wanted them to do was understand that they were inheritors of a promise. And what I want us to see this morning, this main point, what, what I want us to walk away from here with, if you leave here with nothing else, I pray that you will come to the realization that if you have come to faith in Jesus, if you trust Jesus as your Savior, if you acknowledge the sin that is in your life, the sin that we sing about that we're no longer slaves to, the reason we are no longer slaves to that sin is because Jesus has paid the debt of that sin for us so that we can experience life in him. And if he has done that, then we are an heir of God and a recipient of his eternal inheritance. Amen? Now, that's really good news. It would be really good news if it was just, if you trust in Jesus, you'll be forgiven for your sins. That would be really good news. I want to be forgiven for the mistakes that I made, for the sins that I've committed. But it goes beyond that to say, not just are you forgiven for those sins, but you are an inheritor of the promises of God. That you receive an inheritance. That what the Son, Jesus, has accomplished on the cross for you he gives to you as a gift to be able to walk in joy, to walk in life. This is, this is amazingly good news for us. And the way that Paul chooses to describe this relationship is the relationship of adoption. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 5. It says, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. 
so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, if you think of the word adoption, you probably have a lot of kind of pictures that come into your mind. You may have families that if you know that have adopted that come into your mind. You may have experienced adoption in your own family, and you have this image that comes to mind. And what I want to try to do just for a few minutes is pull us back from 2023 in our understanding of adoption today to try to understand what Paul was talking about when he talked about adoption back in the first century. Because Paul's understanding of adoption is similar, although not identical, to what you and I experience. Okay, so can I do that just for a few minutes? Just peel back the layer a little bit and try to help us understand why does he use this language of adoption, and specifically the adoption as sons. Well, I mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating for those of you that were sleeping and or absent. That only sons were eligible for the inheritance. Okay, only sons were eligible for the inheritance. So sometimes in our 2023 sensibilities, we wish that that verse said, uh, to, to in order to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters, or so that we might receive adoption as children of God. But the the point that I think Paul is trying to make is, look, the only people who were able to receive the inheritance were the sons. And so by stating that we are all sons of God, Paul is actually elevating the status of those who are on the bottom of the cultural ladder. And he's saying everybody has the right to be called a son of God. This is why I started in verse 28. Remember what it says there. In verse 28, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male or female. You are what? You are all one in Christ Jesus. One commentator that I read suggested the term uh, son sons and son daughters, if that's helpful for you. If you need to be called a son son or a son daughter, then, then at least attach the term son to the front of it, not for the purpose of equating it to gender, but for the purpose of equating it to the inheritance. I believe that that's what Paul wants us to see is the inheritance is available to all. And I believe that Paul is not disregarding women or Jewish people or slaves. Rather, he's including them in ways that they would have never thought possible in their own culture. They would have never expected that they could be those who received the inheritance. They would have never expected that that would be an option to them. And what Paul is saying is that in Christ, all get the inheritance. Everyone gets the inheritance. It's not on the basis of status. It's not on the basis of gender. It's on the basis of his grace given to you so that you, whoever you are, can be called a son of God, can be called one who receives the inheritance of God. Another aspect of adoption that I think is worth mentioning is that adoption puts the outsider into the position of a son. Okay, the adoption puts an outsider into the position of a son. So the Greek word here, which I'm not going to try to pronounce for adoption, is actually a combination of two words. The first is a noun, son, and the second is a verb, which means to make or to appoint. To make or to appoint a son brought together, these two words were used to describe someone who was not a biological part of the family, but who had been placed in the position or the condition of a son in another family, primarily for the purposes of inheritance. And I'll talk more about this in just a moment. But this is a positional move from someone who is outside of a family to now being brought into a family, okay? This is what adoption is about. You say, that's pretty similar to ours. The difference is, is that in his day, in Paul's day, this was primarily done with adults. It, it, was, it was an adult son that was moved from one family to another, and I'll mention is why that is in just a moment. But look at the way that Paul thinks about this term in other passages and other letters that he writes in Romans chapter 8. Verse 15, it says, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. This is what we just sang about. 
But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Those same two words found in our passage here in Galatians chapter 4. This adoption gives us the right to call out to God as Abba, as Father. We'll mention more about that in a moment as well. Chapter 8, verse 23 of Romans. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. This is the redemption of our bodies. In chapter 9 of Romans, verse 4, he talks about Israel. And he says, look, Israel, to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. And and he goes on to say, but the problem is, is that they're not as concerned about their theology as they are their biology. They're thinking more about their, the fact that they are biologically Jewish people and they're not relating to the theological work that has been done through Christ. And so Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 are really important for helping us to understand the work of God in the people of Israel. But, but what, God is, or what Paul is saying here is that Israel was adopted as well. They were outside the family they were brought in. And this is what our our hope is. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, even as he, that is God, chose us in him, that is Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of Of his will, he took those that were on the outside and he brought them in. So in Paul's mind, adoption is a positional move from someone who is outside to someone who comes inside a family, who comes into something that they were not born into. And so I think that's why Paul really appreciates this term. Because adoption is something that's received and not earned. That's the third thing I want you to see. Adoption is something that's received and not earned. Why does Paul love this term adoption and why does he apply it theologically? Because our salvation is something that is received, not something that is earned. And Paul sees this beautiful picture in this cultural phenomenon known as adoption, this changing of son's status, and he sees that there is something valuable there, something worth holding on to there, and he wants the reader, he wants the the audience, the church that is there to understand that there is salvation that is available not on the basis of them doing the right things, but salvation available based on the fact that God just adopted them. He chose to. He wanted to. He gave them that gift that they could receive, not earn. They're brought in by the gracious and generous gift of somebody else. The fourth thing I want you to understand about this Roman culture and adoption in Paul's day is that adoption was primarily about inheritance and political alliance. This is where it, this is where it gets different than what we experience today. Typically, when we think about adoption, we're thinking about something along the lines of benevolent orphan rescue, which is really a good thing, by the way. And and those that have participated in adoption that brought in somebody who was an orphan or brought in somebody who did not have a home and gave them a home and loved on them, that's a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing. I would say a theologically rich thing that we should be participating in as a church, as Christians. Caring for orphans and widows in their distress is what James calls true religion. But here, adoption was primarily about inheritance and political alliance. Here's the way that it typically worked in the first century. Usually there was a household father who had no living heir. Okay, Either he had all daughters, (laughs) like me, or, or he had sons that had passed away or sons that were incapable of actually managing the household. And through the father's discernment, he saw, I do not want this wayward son, this prodigal son, if you will, to be the inheritor of my, of my property, of my estate. And so he would go find a qualified heir and appoint this young adult male from outside the family to take on his name, to receive his inheritance, 
and to run the estate. This is how the adoption happened. Uh, it was a, uh, somebody with means saw that they had accumulated something and wanted to pass on a legacy to people, but had no one to manage it. And so to just get, instead of just giving it to the state or letting some wayward person kind of come in and ruin what has been built, they found somebody who they deemed worthy and responsible and appointed that person, adopted that person to be a son, to come into the home, to take on a new name, to receive the inheritance and to manage the father's estate. This adopted son could come from a good family. They weren't just an orphan. They could be from a good family, but they were chosen by this higher ranking family to carry on the name of the father. This was actually an honorable position for many who received this kind of an adoption. And there was political engagement that was a part of that. There was social alliances that were made as families negotiated for strength. This was all part of the arrangement. In fact, many of the Roman emperors were adopted in this very same manner. Um, men like uh, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Tiberius, Caligula, Nero, Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, all of them were adopted into families that they were not born into because they saw something in them and they wanted to give them the opportunity to, give, to get a status, to get a position. And so in this sense, adoption is a little bit different than how we would understand it. And so when we read Galatians 3, verse 29, and it says, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Remember, Paul is mixing and matching some analogies here. He's, he wants us to try to understand his, his train of thought. And so he's writing to a church. He's writing to people, people who have accepted Jesus, have come to faith in Jesus, and who are being told that the only way to really be a follower of Jesus is to do the works of the law. And he's saying, no, if you are Christ, that's all you have to be. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. And by nature of being Abraham's offspring, he's saying, then you are the inheritors of a promise. Then you are heirs according to the promise. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is actually no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date that is set by the father. This makes sense, doesn't it? You understand what he's saying here? He's saying, look, even if you're a son and you're born into a wealthy household, while you are a child, you are functionally no different than a slave in that household. You have the right of living in the household, but you have no power. You have no ability as a child. And the only time that you receive the inheritance is when you come of age, when you demonstrate the majority. At the father's appointed time, that's when you become an adult. That's when you become one who can manage. That's when you realize, if you will, the sonship that you have. Until that time, you're still guardian. You're still under guardians. You're still under managers until you're ready. And, and that's what we saw in Galatians 3. I think it was verse 24. This idea of being under a guardian, that being under the law is like being in prison. It's like being in a cage. It, it restrains you, but it doesn't change you at all. And, and that's what he saw as the problem with the Old Testament way of doing things was, was they want you to obey Old Testament rules. They want you to be Jewish, but being Jewish does not save you. It might restrain your behavior because now you have some commandments to follow, but it doesn't actually change you. The only way that a person can be changed is through Jesus. This is Paul's driving message through this book. He says it over and over again in different ways from different angles because he wants the reader to understand this super important truth. And so he says in verse 3 of chapter 4, in the same way, we also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now, this phrase, the being enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, is another 
really difficult phrase to translate. And the way that I know this is because you look at other English translations <laughs> and, and they're just doing their best with it. Now, the King, King James says this is bondage under the elements of the world. And I don't know about you, but when I think of the elements of the world, I think about the periodic table of elements and that can't be what Paul's talking about. Or the New Living Translation, which says we are slaves to the basic supernatural principles of this world. That's not much clearer. Or the New International Version, which tries to combine all these things and says this is like slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. And I still don't know exactly what he's talking about, but if you read a little bit further in chapter 4, you get an idea, I think, of what Paul has in mind. Next week, we will look at this passage more closely, but for now, just look down at verse 9 in chapter 4, where it says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? What are these things? What is the elementary principles of the world. I think it's the way that the world thinks. I think it's human wisdom and human philosophy, and it's our attempt to try to make sense of things. And, and he's saying, I believe, that look, there is the way that the world thinks, the elementary systems of the world, the principles of the world, and then there is the gospel. And if you think that it makes sense to trust Jesus and be forgiven of your sins and experience eternal life. That's not human wisdom. That's not how a natural person thinks I need to deal with my problems. A natural person thinks the way that I deal with my problem is through self-help. You know how I know? Go to Barnes & Noble. There's all kinds of shelves about self-help what to do, how to think, how to process, how to get better. The world is full of this kind of wisdom, but the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God are not meant to be meshed together. They're not meant to be a hybrid. You don't come up with some hybrid spirituality. This is a warning, I believe, against syncretism, against bringing two competing ideas together and saying, well, you can take your faith in Jesus, but you have to add something to it in order to gain salvation. You can take your belief in, in what it means to be saved in Jesus, and you can add some practices to it, and that's how you're going to be saved. Whether it's Old Testament law, or it's New Age philosophy, or or it's any other kind of worldly philosophy, you don't mesh that with the gospel in order to get truth. You don't mesh them together. You don't smash them together and say, well, if I take a little bit of this and a little bit of this, I create this fun new potion religion, and that's going to help me be saved. Why? Because Paul's conclusion is that the law or New Age philosophy or any other wisdom of the world cannot save you. So why would you add it to what does? Those things don't save you. Why would you add them to something that does? If there is a way of salvation that is only through the work of Jesus Christ, why would you ever try to add something to that? It doesn't make sense. If that is the way, then let that be the way. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. You don't come to the Father unless you come through me. If he has made it clear what the way is, then why would we ever try to add anything to what he has given us? And so what I believe Paul is saying here is that we need to be careful not to add to these elementary principles. Don't be enslaved, he says in verse 3. Don't be enslaved to these elementary principles of the world because they can't save you. They just keep you in bondage. And so the question that I asked at the beginning of the sermon is, do I think of God as my father? I want you now to look at verses 4 and 5 and begin to think about, do I think about God as my father? It says in verses 4 and 5, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, okay? 
don't hold on to this paganism, this human religion, these elementary principles, because they ultimately keep you enslaved. But when the fullness of time had come, according to God's foreknowledge, God sent forth his Son. I love this phrase, when the fullness of time had come, because look what he just said in a moment ago in verse 2. But he's under guardian and managers until the date that is set by his father. Until the fullness of the father's time has come. The father knows. Do you see this? The father knows when it's time. The father is the one who's in control. The Father is the one who is shaping history. When the fullness of time had come. And why was it the right time for Jesus to come? Under the Roman Empire of the first century, there's, why why then? Why not now? Why not a thousand years before that? Why not 500 years later? Why that time? We don't know specifically why that moment, but it was right to the Father. It was good to the Father. The fullness of time had come. The prophecies pointed. Everything aligned. It was time for the Son to come. Because the Father knows. Do you see him? Do you think of him as your Father? The Son came in obedience to the Father as a human. So it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. As a human, this is the point. He came as a human, fully God, fully man. Divine mystery, I understand. Confusing, I understand. But true, fully God, fully man. He came into the world born of a woman. Why? It's to be able to relate to you and I, according to the book of Hebrews, to be able to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, to be able to live the life that you should be living, but you can't live because you're a sinner, to live that life for you so that you don't have to bear the penalty of sin. He came to be a human so that we could see what real humanity was supposed to look like in the beginning. And he did it for you. He did it for me so that I would know what it looks like, so that I had an example, so that when this world gets confusing, I don't have to try to go to a self-help book. I just need to go to Jesus. I just need to see how did Jesus deal with people? How did he love people? How did he serve people? Where did he show up with people? Who did he cast judgment on? Not on those that were sinning, mostly on those that were religious elites, that were thumbing their noses at people and telling them you got to get in line and do what I tell you to do. Jesus was countercultural in almost every way. He was not what we expected a king or a savior to look like, and yet he is the one that we need to be following. The other reason why he was born of a woman is to fulfill the prophecy that went all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, which said that the seed of a woman would crush the head of a serpent. He had to come as a human in order to defeat death, in order to defeat the enemy. That was promised at the very beginning when our first forefathers, Mary, Mary, Eve and Adam sinned, sorry. When Adam and Eve first sinned, that prophecy was made that through the seed of a woman, the serpent of the head would be crushed. I've mentioned this before, but I love the opening scene of that movie, The Temptation of Christ. You remember it a couple years ago was in Latin. Jim Caviezel played Jesus in that that movie, that uh, depiction of Jesus' death, the passion of Christ. The opening scene is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And out comes a snake as he finishes praying. And he gets up, and the first scene is him crushing the head of the snake. And then moving towards the cross. Go back and watch that scene. It's powerful. It's powerful. Fulfilling the prophecy of conquering death. The son came in obedience to the father, born of a woman, born under the law, it says. The son came to redeem the slave, to free us from the prison of the law, to set up an adoption, a son placement, a transfer of position, to bring us from outside the family into the family to move us to a place where we could become the heir into a family that we were not born into? Do you think of God as your father? 
the family, by the way, that you're placed into, the one that you're adopted into, it should gain more prominence over the family that you were born into. In fact, that might hurt a little bit if you start to unpack that, so be careful. Because the reality of being part of a family that you were adopted into should have more prominence over the family that you were born into, again, goes against our sensibilities. Our sensibilities say, it's me, it's my team, it's my kids, it's my family. That's the most important thing. That's who I fight for. That's who I show up for. That's where I am, and that's good. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, your primary family becomes the people of God, not your biological family. To the extent that your biological family is also part of the family of God, praise God, that's, that's good. But to the extent that they're not, that's why Jesus says some really hard things about who is my mother, who is my brother. Those that are doing the will of my father, that's my family. This is my family. Which means that my alliances need to be more in tune with the things of God than with the things of this world. And if you're more comfortable around people who think like you do, let's say politically, for instance, but don't claim the name of Jesus, then you are around people who claim the name of Jesus but maybe apply their politics differently, that's a problem. It is a problem to be more politically aligned than we are heart aligned, theologically aligned. We may see the application of politics differently, but if we claim Jesus, if we abide by Jesus, if we love Jesus, then that should be what holds us together. And if you'd rather go to dinner with someone who thinks like you politically than someone who worships with you theologically, my guess is is that your priorities might be misaligned. You might need to do some heart work about what really matters to you. Because what should matter more than anything else is the fact that we are a family. That we are a family underneath the Father who have been adopted in and we have been given the rights of sonship. And so do I know that he's my Father? Do I think of him that way? And secondly, do I experience him that way? Do I understand him that way? Verses 6 and 7. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. These two words, these passionate words, these personal words, these familial words. He is our Father. You're no longer a slave, it says in verse 7, but you're a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Amen? Amen. Amen. No longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God because of what God has done. Because of sending his spirit. By giving us the opportunity to experience God as our Abba, as our daddy, as our papa, as our father. So I want to close just by giving us some implications to think about. What does this mean for us. Why do we need to consider this? Because if we in here, I'm just going to make an assumption for a second. I grant, or grant me, it's a, it's a big assumption. But let's just say everybody in this room is a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's just say that for a moment, okay? That everybody in this room is a follower of Jesus Christ. If that's true, then in here we are on level ground. Okay? That's an implication of this passage. In here, we are on level ground. What does that mean? It means that in the eyes of God, membership into his household is granted on the basis of his son. He becomes your Abba Father, not based on your education, not based on your wealth, not based on your physical stature, not based on your beauty, not based on your social media presence, not based on your gender, your nationality, your politics, or your social standing. You do not come to him based on you. Rather, you come to him based on Jesus, and the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That's what that means. That's what we have to hold on to, that none of us who are adopted into the family is more important than anyone else. We are here to worship the Father. Nobody has preeminence in the family of God. The only one that is above the family is Jesus himself. So staff, nope. Elders? Nope. Life stage community leaders? Nope. We all come to the Father through the adoption that he offers, which means, by the way, that we need to respect one another 
and the gifts and the talents and the perspectives and the background and the culture that all of us bring to this community. We have to respect that. To demand that it happen my way. To, to make some sort of a assumption that because that's how we've always done it, that must be how we always do it, is not reality. Uh, you, yeah, you can clap. That's, that's on you, not on me. I, I wrote it. You can clap. That's, that's up to you. <laughs> but that's what it means, that, that we respect all the people that God has chosen to call his sons to give an inheritance to. We respect them, and we value their voice, and we listen, and we, and we applaud, and we raise, and we cheer, and we go with, and we do things that maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable to me because I recognize it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about us. It's about the family. Number two, in here, we are home. Oh, this is good. In here, we are home. If you travel around the world, or if you travel to different cultures, if you go in and out of history through, through, through history, you will see that there are styles of homes that differ and change no matter where you go in the world. But one thing that should always be true of a home is that it is a place where you belong. It's a place where you belong. Whether it's a mud hut or a mansion, it's a place where you belong. It's a place where you know people that are there and you are known by people who are there. It's a place where you love the people who are there and you are loved by the people who are there. Redemption, the process of redemption, is about belonging and finding safety in a home of God's people. And if we are the family of God, then we need this to be home for us. Safety for us. Known and being known. Loved and being loved. Authentically living our lives in front of one another with all of its hurts, scabs, and mess ups in order to say, but you're my family. You're my brother. You're my sister. You are an inheritor of the promises of God. And I love you and I value you and I'm here for you. And I show up because you belong. In here, number three, we are free. In here, we are free. In Paul's day, an adopted son was freed from the debt of the family that they came from. Okay? So get this. If, if in Paul's day, uh, an adult son was moved from his biological family into an adoptive family for the purposes of inheritance and for the purpose of political alliance, if he came into that new home with debt, that debt was canceled in the new home that he came into. In Jesus, when you make the change from the old home to his eternal home, your debt is canceled. It's done. You are not responsible for the weight of sin, your past, your hang-ups, your sin, your, your addiction, all the things that you have walked through life with. When you come to Jesus, he says, you're now my son. You've moved from that family to this family. You bear my name. The inheritance that I have is for you. And all of that mess is over. It's done. It has no power over you. It has no guilt over you. You can walk away from it. Now, as Kevin rightly pointed out, do we continue to struggle sometimes in sin? Yes. Yes, we do. Because we await this adoption to be finally realized. But positionally, that debt is canceled at the cross. Number four, in here, all things are being made new. In here, all things are new. It's a new family. It's a new household. It's a new father. It means new standards and new practices. While we are free here, while we're at home here, we're also living according to the norms of the father. And if he establishes the rules of the household, then we obey the father, not us. Capiche? You with me? If the father says this is how it goes, then we go, okay, father, you're the one in charge. If he establishes the rules, then we obey 
him. That means that we are being changed. That means we begin to bear fruit. Wait till we get to Galatians 5. He'll make this point really clear. We begin to bear fruit. We begin to change. We begin to not be as we were. We become who he made us to be. He doesn't, he doesn't allow us not to. In fact, I love the phrase. You've probably heard it before. God accepts you as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. He accepts you as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. He's not content to say, welcome in, now you're good, which is how some of us want it to go, by the way. We want the fire insurance of salvation without the life change of sanctification. But the reality is, is that God says, I accept you as you are, but I don't want to leave you there. I want to make you into something that's new. I could talk about this passage for a long time. There's so many beautiful things to see in here, but... Again, I want us to leave with that glorious understanding that in Jesus Christ, we are no longer a slave. We are an heir of God. We are recipients of his promise. And because that's true, because it's true, when we come to the Lord's table, which we do every week here at Redwood Chapel, at least I'll say 99% of the weeks, we miss some. But we come, we do this. We do this, this kind of ritual activity, this, this repetitive thing. And it's not meant to be just repetitive. It's not just meant to be the thing we do at the end of the service. It's meant to be indicative of our relationship to the Son. It's saying the blood that you shed represented in this cup is a new covenant that you have made with me. It's a new relationship that all who are of faith are made righteous. And this bread, which is broken, representing your body that's been broken for us, is, it's living, it's active, it, it, it gives me life. And so if you did not pick up the elements of communion when you came into the room, I'd encourage you just to raise your hand right now and our ushers will bring them to you. But if you are a child of God, then partake of these elements. As rudimentary as they are in our plastic throwaway containers, Partake and, and, and allow the symbol, symbolism of what you are doing to connect you not only to the ancientness of our faith, but also to the corporateness of our faith as people around the world. Think about that. All over the world today are taking the Lord's Supper in countries where there's persecution, in countries where they speak different languages, in places where they don't have a, a beautiful facility like this, they still will gather and they still will partake. And we get to do it with them and with one another as a family to our Father. If you're not walking in community with a family, we invite you here at Redwood Chapel to join us. But not just join us, join it our Father. Join God in what He is doing. We want to continually be faithful to make and mature disciples of Jesus until Jesus comes back and says, you're done. The Father's time is now. But until that day, we want to be faithful to that, and so we want to be a family one to another. We would invite you to join us and be a part of that. If you don't have a church family, we'd love to have an opportunity to get to know you. God bless you. Have a great day.